week I want to look at how do you have an awesome family, fighting for an awesome family. I choose this word intentionally, fighting, because families are not awesome by accident. They're, by accident, they're average. And you have to fight for your family if you want it to be a great family because there are all kinds of forces working against your family in our society. Now, I'm not gonna spend a minute detailing those. I don't wanna make a laundry list or a litany of all of the things that are working against the family today, but there are economic forces, there are spiritual forces, there are moral forces, there are cultural and social forces that want to destroy the idea of family and specifically your family. What I'm much more interested in is looking at the positive side, and that is how do you fight for an awesome family? And I have discovered after talking to thousands and thousands of families that you can find four common traits in families that are really awesome. And we're gonna look at those today. And in order to help you remember these four traits of an awesome family, whether you're a brother or a sister in a family, or you're a mother or father, or you're a child, or whatever you are, um, these are four things that make an awesome family. And the first symbol of an awesome family is this board game called Candyland. <laughs> How many of you remember the board game Candyland? How many of you played this game, Candyland? How many of you wish you never have to play it again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, all the hands of preschool moms just went up just now. This is, doesn't require a whole lot of intelligence to play this game. In fact, it says ages three years and up. It's a pure game of chance. But why does the game Candyland represent awesome families? Here's the first reason, write it down. Awesome families are playful. It's the first common denominator of great families. They know how to play. They know how to fun, have fun. They enjoy life together. This is a missing ingredient in so many families today. Uh, today our families are too busy, too tired, too negative, too worn out, and too serious. Who wants to come home from school to that? Families should be fun. The average family is all work and no play. It's just getting us to the next appointment. Awesome families are fun. Awesome families are playful. But most people don't know that the Bible says that play is an important part of your life. And play is essential to adults, not just to children. In fact, play is, is connected to creativity. The more play you have in life, the more creative you're gonna be. If you don't have anything play, any fun in your life, you're not a very creative person. All work, no play makes Jack a dull boy. And so you need to have fun in your life. And the Bible talks about this and actually commands it. Let me show you some scriptures. Uh, this first section is from Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon, who was the wisest man who ever lived. God said, what do you want me? He said, I want to be the wisest man who ever lived. God said, I'll answer that request. So let's look at some verses. Ecclesiastes 8, 15, Solomon says, I commend the enjoyment of life. Circle the word enjoyment. As I said, we know that play is extremely important to development. In fact, we know, we've known for years that play is essential to preschoolers. For preschoolers, play is work. They're actually developing when they play. And, and recess is not a waste of time. Recess, it, kids are developing at much at recess as they are sitting down with a book open or things like that. Paul says, uh, up here on the screen, look at this verse, 1 Timothy 6, 17. God generously gives us everything for our what? Did you realize that everything in the world God created, he created for you to enjoy? Now listen, God wants life to be enjoyed, not merely endured. And a lot of you are simply enduring life. God wants you to enjoy life. The wisest man who ever lived, Solomon says, I recommend, I commend the enjoyment of life. God says everything I created is for enjoyment. If you're too busy to enjoy life, you're too busy. God meant for you to play and to have some fun. Ecclesiastes 11:7. People ought to enjoy every day, not just on a weekend, not just vacation, ought to enjoy every day of their lives no matter how long they live. Now why is that important that you enjoy every day? Because you don't know how long you're gonna live. You don't know if you've got next week, next month, you don't know if you've got tomorrow, you don't know if you've got tonight. So whatever living you're gonna do, you better do it now, not say, well I'm gonna enjoy life in retirement. 
No, you need to enjoy life now. And if you have children, you need to be enjoying life with the children because the kids aren't gonna be at home forever. Solomon gets very specific about the kind of fun you're supposed to have in a family. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 9, he says this. Enjoy life with your wife. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love. Dads, if you're a dad here today, the greatest gift you can give your children is to love their mom. To have fun and enjoy life with their mom. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love. You see, when a father shows love for the mother of the kids, it creates great stability. It creates great security. It creates great peace in the heart of little children. And when I hear couples saying, well, you know, we, don't, we really can't afford or can't have time to go out because of the kids, serious mistake. Serious mistake. Your kids need to see you loving each other because you are the first and greatest model of relationships. And if they see parents just passing in the night and working and working and working but no real relationship, that's what they're gonna grow up thinking marriage is all about. Love your wife, enjoy life with your wife. The Bible says in Psalm 127, children are a gift from God. They are a gift from God. Now let's be honest, sometimes they're a gift you'd like to exchange. <laughs> okay, but, but they are a gift, okay, they are a gift. And what is a gift? A gift is given and it's meant to be enjoyed. Are you enjoying your kids or are they just your pet project? You're gonna grow up right and it's all serious and you're not enjoying the gift that God gave you. Psalm 8, 15. This one's gonna blow your mind. Look at this verse on the screen. You should write this one down. It says, I recommend having fun. Did you know that verse is in the Bible? The wisest man who ever lived said, I recommend having fun. And that way, you'll experience some happiness along all the hard work that God gives you. And so Candyland is the symbol of an awesome family because awesome families are playful. Now the second symbol of an awesome family is a watering can. A watering can, because we use this to to water flowers, plants, you know, vegetables. And in many ways, a family is like a garden. You have to grow it. You have to develop it. You have to cultivate it. A garden doesn't grow on its own. You have to weed it. You have to water it. You have to care for it. And this is the second characteristic of awesome families that makes them different from average families. Write this down. Awesome families encourage growth. They create an atmosphere of lifelong learning. They help each other develop. And one of the things that you do in, a, in an awesome family is you support each other. And I'm not just talking about the kids growing up. I'm saying that you're always growing. Your family never stops growing. Mom never stops growing. Everybody encourages mom to grow. Dad never stops growing. Everybody encourages dad to grow. Brother, sister, everybody encourages everybody to keep growing. If you're not growing, your family is boring. You're just stuck in a rut. You haven't learned anything new, developed any new interest in a long time. Your family's boring. Now look at how Jesus grew. The Bible tells us in Luke 2.52, this is when Jesus was 12 years old. It says, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and favor with men. Now notice, there are four kinds of growth you wanna have in your family. You grow in wisdom, that's intellectual growth, mental growth. You grow in stature, that's physical health. You grow in favor with God, that's spiritual growth. And you grow in favor with man, that's social growth. Every person in your family needs to be growing in all four of these, not just the kids, but you. Mom, you, dad, you, brother, you, sister, you need to be growing physically, mentally, spiritually, and socially. And I will tell you this, most of your problems as an adult comes from the fact that you didn't learn certain things correctly as a child. And if you didn't learn certain skills as a child, then you're gonna have a rough life the rest of your life. 
There are five things you must learn in your family. And if you don't learn them there, life's gonna be tough for you. You might write these down. The first one is, the first thing we have to learn is what to do with feelings. One of the most important skills in life. How do I handle my emotions? What do I do with them? How do I deal with how I feel? What do you do with feelings? And in a good, awesome family, you learn how to recognize your feelings, how to name your feelings, how to own up to your feelings, how to identify your feelings, how to express your feelings correctly rather than incorrectly, how not to stuff them, and how to deal with how you feel. If you don't learn how to deal with how you feel in your family, you go through life an emotional cripple. You have to relearn it somewhere else. And the reason why so many marriages split up is because they didn't learn in their family how to deal with how you feel correctly and effectively. And you need to let people be honest and let kids express their emotions. One of the stupidest things a parent can say is, stop crying, don't cry, don't cry. Why? Crying, there's nothing wrong with crying. Tears are a gift from God. If you're telling your kids, stuff your emotions, stuff your emotions, stuff your emotions, they're gonna have problems with their emotions the rest of their life. There's nothing wrong with crying. There's nothing uh, to be ashamed of with crying. And telling your kids stop crying is saying, deny your emotions, deny how you feel, and you learn to stuff it. And that comes out in all kinds of strange relationship patterns later on. In a true family, in an awesome family, we learn how to recognize that's a good emotion, that's a harmful emotion. And we learn to name it, own it, speak about it, identify it, talk about it, that's a key. So you name them, you don't stuff them. Second skill you have to learn in the family is how to handle conflict. And if you don't learn how to handle conflict in your marriage, or in your family, you're gonna have problems in your marriage. Because you don't know, nobody taught you the skills on how to resolve and clarify conflict. And if kids don't see their parents working problems out in front of them and showing how, this is how we deal when we have a difference. This is how we deal when we get hurt, how we deal with when we get mad. Then you have a problem with that. And what happens is most people in conflict, they become either a mute and a martyr or they become a maniac. They either hold it in or they explode it. A third thing, really big thing you have to learn in family is how to handle loss because you're gonna have a lot of losses in life. You're gonna have big losses, you're gonna have small losses. And you gotta teach kids, and even parents have to learn how to grieve a loss. Because nobody wins all the time. In fact, for a kid to have an unbroken string of wins in early life with no losses is actually detrimental to them. You don't want your kid to win all the time because when they get out in the real world and they face the inevitable losses that they're not number one all the time, it's devastating if they haven't learned that failure won't kill you, failure won't destroy you, a loss won't be the end of your life. You don't win everything. It's like in a, if you're in a, a professional baseball team, it's actually good to have a few losses in preseason because then the pressure's off. What you don't want to do is have an unbroken season of all perfect wins and then lose in the Super Bowl. That's the, that's the painful. If you're going to lose, you might as well lose early in life and learn from it. And so we learn how to deal with losses. One of the verses you need to memorize, whether you're a parent or not, every person should memorize this verse. Write it down. Proverbs 24, 16. You need to teach this verse to your children. Proverbs 24, 16. It's one of my life verses. It says this, here on the screen. Even if good people fall seven times, they'll get back up again. I love that verse. It says, even good people fall. The word there, actually in Hebrew, is the word righteous. It says, though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. Even when good people fall, you know what? Even the best people, the well-intentioned people, they stumble, they mess up, they flub, they say the wrong thing, they do the wrong thing. We all fall, we all stumble, we all mess up. And when we fall, that's not the important thing. It says good people get back up again, even if they fall seven times. That's the difference between 
a success and a failure. That verse is talking about what psychologists call resilience. Resilience is the most important characteristic for a child if they're gonna succeed in life. Resilience. Do they have the ability to get back up again? They fall off the bike. See, a lot of kids learn, I'm not even gonna try because I, I stumbled once, so I give up. I went to one practice at, at music and I didn't like it, so I'm just gonna give up. I went to one game uh, in soccer and I didn't like it, or I, I, I messed up, I embarrassed myself, so I'm gonna give up. And, and so people learn to give up and then they spend the rest of their lives facing challenges and giving up. But in teaching a child resilience to keep on getting back up, those are the, the leaders of the world are people who have the most resilience. They're not any more successful, they have just as many losses in life, it's just they don't give up. And they are resilient. Number four, fourth thing we learn from our families is we learn what values matter most. What values matter most. And you have to just help your kids know this is important and this is not. Now, would you agree that the world is teaching our kids values that aren't very good? Everybody agree with that one? All around us, the world is teaching our kids values that we don't agree with. The world teaches that all that matters is how you look. That image is everything. Doesn't matter what your character is, it's how you look. The world teaches that the more money you have, the more important you are, the more successful, uh, the more fulfilled you'll be, uh, the more significant your life is. That's not true. The world teaches is that everything is about sex. It's not. It's not. The world teaches that the more you can get people to praise you, the more valuable you are. That's not true. And, and our kids are learning a lot of values from movies, from video games, from songs, from their friends, from all of culture, all these things that aren't true. It's important to teach our kids the three basic temptations of life. The Bible calls them the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It has to do with how I feel, what I do, and what I get in life. S secularist or philosophy would call them hedonism, materialism, and secularism. But basically, it's sex, salary, and status. It's basically saying life is about three things. Getting all the good things you can, possessions, having all of the pleasure you want, regardless of how it hurts other people, passion, and becoming important and having status, that's position. These are the three temptations that Jesus went through, that Moses went through, that Adam went through. I could take you through the whole Bible. And, and teaching our kids what these are so they can recognize false values. That what matters most in life is sex, what matters most in life is money, and what matters most in life is power, prestige, and popularity. They're just not true. And every single advertising ever created by anybody appeals to one of these three temptations. Every single one. Every print ad, broadcast ad, TV ad appeals to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And the product says, you get our product, you'll be sensual, you'll feel good, you just have all kinds of pleasure inside of you. Or if you get our product, you'll be envied. You'll, you're number one, we do what's best for you, look out for number one, and, and I gotta do what's best for me. And it's all about you, you, you. Or, or, or materialism, you need this product, because it'll make you significant. It'll make you important. You know, when my kids were little, I taught them these three values. I said, these are the three values you're gonna be up against, and none of them are true. And I would, we would stand in front of the TV and watch commercials, and I would pay them a nickel for the one who could figure out which value was being promoted by that ad. Ah, lust of flesh, boom, here's a nickel. Now, I realize that was materialism. But at least they were learning to spot what most kids and even adults accept without question. We, we teach our kids the values that matter most. And the fifth thing we learn from our families is good habits. Good habits. Habits are determined your character. If 
one of the marks of, uh, of um, an awesome family is that we help each other grow. How do you do that? How do you help mom grow? How do you help dad grow? How do you help brother and sister grow? How do you help your nephews grow and nieces grow? Well, let me give you two ways that help people grow and two ways that don't. This applies in every area of life. Two ways that help people grow. Number one, we grow through example. Through example. Jesus did this in teaching the disciples. John 13, he says, since I have washed your feet, which was a, a model of humility and service, it's an act of service, since I have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I've done to you. We learn best by example. Your kids don't want to hear a sermon, they want to see it. They want to see it in your life. And second way we help people grow is through conversations. Critical conversations. If you're not having conversations with your kids about real issues, they're not growing. We grow through conversations. Unfortunately, most conversations we have with kids have to do with we need to get here by this time and get back to here by this time. And conversations are about schedule, eating, or homework. And no conversations about the stuff that really matters in life. Deuteronomy chapter six, verse seven is very specific. And it says this to parents. You must teach God's commandment. That's not an option. You must teach God's commandments to your children and talk about them. Circle that, talk about them. That means conversations. You're to have conversations with your kids about the Bible. Talk about them, and then it gives us four places to do this. When you are at home, you might circle these four things. When you are at home, when you are out for a walk, Third time is at bedtime, and, the, and then number four, the first thing in the morning, breakfast. He's saying, these are the teachable moments of your family. When you're at home, when you're out for a walk, in other words, you're, you're relaxing, recreation time, you're fishing, you're playing, uh, when, at bedtime and first thing in the morning, the four teachable moments. By example and by conversation, so the two ways we help each other grow. You can help your wife, your husband grow through by example and through conversation. Let me tell you two ways that don't work, and it's the ones we all use. Write these down. Not through criticism. Not through criticizing. We think that being critical of someone will actually help them grow. It has never, ever, ever worked. Nagging doesn't work. Condemning doesn't work. Criticizing and complaining doesn't work. It is totally ineffective in helping a person change. Why? Because when you criticize, you're focusing on what you don't want rather than what you do want. For instance, if I'm a professional pitching coach for the Angels or for any team, and I go out on an important game, and I go out to the pitcher on the mound, and I say to the pitcher, whatever you do, don't throw a curveball. What have I just planted in his mind? A picture of a curveball. I didn't give him a picture of the right thing to do, I gave him a picture of the wrong thing to do, and I told him to focus on the wrong thing, and that's gonna pretty much guarantee he's not gonna do the right thing. When you criticize a child or your wife or your husband or anybody else, they go, yeah, you're right. Criticizing just labels people. It reinforces the negative. It does not work. So why are you so critical? Why are you so rough? Why are you so tough on your kids? Why well, want them to be tough? You're not making them tough, you're making them a failure. Through all your incessant criticizing, they never measure up. And at some point, when it's criticism, 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 the kid just goes, okay, I give up. I can't please my dad. I can't please my mom. I, I just give up. And so let me just show you how lazy I can be. Let me show you how late I can be. Let me show you how irresponsible I can be. I'll show you. And, and so it doesn't work. Judging, criticizing, demean, it, it, is not, it didn't work on you. And by the way, it doesn't work in preaching either which is why I don't use it on you. I could get up here every week and say, okay, let's talk about your sins this week. That'll be a four hour sermon. Okay. And I could get up here every week and tell you everything you're doing wrong. It doesn't work. 
Why? Number one, you know what you're doing wrong, and me telling you about it doesn't, isn't gonna change it. You have to promote the positive alternative. That's called repentance. Change your mind. Every one of my sermons are preaching for repentance. Repentance doesn't mean stop doing bad, it means start doing good. And that's what it's all about. So, not through criticism. Look at what the Bible says, Ephesians 6, 4, to parents. Don't keep on scolding and nagging your children. It doesn't work. Making them angry and resentful. Instead, bring them up with the loving training and teaching of the Lord. Another verse in the Bible, Colossians chapter three, it says specifically to dad, it says, dad, don't be so hard on your kids, you drive them to resentment. It says, don't keep demeaning them, don't keep criticizing them, don't keep judging them, don't keep telling them everything that they're doing wrong that makes them angry and bitter. It says, that's dumb for a dad to do, not to criticize it. And then there's another one that we use, and this one doesn't work either. We don't help people grow this way, not through comparing. Anytime you compare anybody to anybody else, you've made a major mistake in life. Why, because everybody's unique, everybody's different, there's nobody in the world like you, so you are incomparable. And the Bible tells us not to compare. You should never compare your wife to anybody else, you should never compare your husband to anybody else, you should never compare your lawn or your house, or your job to anybody else. You certainly should never c compare your kids. Why can't you be more like your brother? Why can't you be more like your mom? Why can't you be more like your dad? I'll tell you why, because I'm not them. And neither are you. Comparing never, never works. And when you do it, 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 it's unhelpful, it's unfair, and it's lethal to any relationship. You start comparing your wife to somebody else, you're, you're headed for divorce court. It's lethal. Just stop, doing, the Bible says over and over again you should never compare. Let me show you one verse, Galatians 6, 4. Each person should judge his own actions. Let me be the judge of my own actions. And not compare himself with others. Then he could be proud for what he himself has done. You say, wait a minute, I thought pride was a sin. There's a good kind of pride and there's a bad kind of pride. The good kind of pride is, hey, I did the best I could with what I had, I'm proud of what I did. The bad kind of pride is, I'm better than so and so over there. That's comparing. Now let me give you a third symbol of an awesome family. And the third symbol of an awesome family is a raincoat. And it's a raincoat. What is a raincoat for? A raincoat is for protection. You remember these? You remember your cute little booties with them? Okay. Don't forget your booties, okay? <laughs> All right, now, let me show you a verse. Look up here on the screen. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 45, Jesus said this, it rains on both those who do right and those who do wrong. What does that verse mean? It means good things and bad things come into everybody's life whether you're doing it right or doing it wrong. So next time you think you got a problem, say, well, God must be punishing me, you're, you're wrong, you're wrong. The Bible says bad things happen to good people Bad things happen to bad people. It rains on both the good and the bad because we're in a broken world. And when you go through life, you're gonna go through storms. Every member of your family is gonna go through storms. Emotional storms, financial storms, moral storms, physical storms like illnesses, relational storms like conflict. You can't go through life without storms because it rains on both the good and the bad, those who are trying to do the right thing and those who couldn't care less. And when you go through a storm, you're gonna need some protection. You're gonna need some covering. When the rains and the thunder and the lightning and the snow and the hail come, you need a raincoat. Families are meant to be a raincoat in the storms of life, okay? Write this down. Awesome families protect each other. Awesome families protect each other, because in a storm, you need support. Ecclesiastes 4.9 says this. Two 
are better than one. And if one of them falls down, the other can help him up. But if someone is alone and falls, it's just too bad. It's just, you know, it's just too bad, because there's no one there to help him up. In the storms of life, you need other people to help you get through that, that tough time. Sometimes a child is going through a storm. Sometimes mom is going through a storm. Sometimes dad is going through a storm. And no matter which of our family members going through a storm, we have to help each other, we protect each other. Families stick together, families are a raincoat. Now let me give you three storms, write these down, that we need to care for each other in our family. And anybody can go through these storms. Mom can go through these storms, dad can go. Number one is change. Change is a storm in life. It's like a big bump in the road. You're just going down the road smoothly and all of a sudden a major change happens, boom, and it throws your car out of line. And change can be upsetting, particularly to kids. Kids don't like change. It's a storm of life and we need a family to be around them when there's a, a major or even a minor change. Now, if I'm driving down the road and I hit a pothole, it throws my wheels completely out of a line and I have to take my car in to get it realigned because of the change I just went through. I highly recommend you get counseling when you've gone through a major change in life. Counseling is a good thing. It's not a shameful thing, it's not a bad thing, and it's a good investment in your family. When you've gone through a major change, it's good to get some advice from the outside. You're not a freak, you're not a nut, you're just getting coaching. Any person who's smart gets coaching. Every professional singer has a vocal coach. They don't just depend on their talent, they've got a vocal coach. Every professional athlete has a personal coach. And if you are a CEO of one of the biggest corporations in the world, you've got an executive coach. You've got somebody on the outside who's giving you counsel. Sometimes you need a family coach. I highly recommend when you go through uh, the changes of life and you hit a bump, go get some counsel. Get a third perspective to help you work through that change. Another storm of life what I call harmful ideas. Harmful ideas. All around our little kids are being bombarded with harmful ideas. By the time a child gets to be 18 years old, they have amassed 18,000 hours of television viewing and they have seen thousands and thousands of murders by the time they're 18 years old. And if they're playing video games, it's tens of thousands of murders. And they've seen sex portrayed in the wrong way. They've seen life portrayed in the wrong way. They've been given all kinds of violent, harmful, and hurtful ideas. Many children, listen to me, many children are provided for, but they are not protected. They're letting their kids go to movies they have no business going to see, watch TV shows they have no business watching, read books and listen to music and follow celebrities they have no business of following. And the kids, you could be a parent and you've got a perfectly balanced, gluten-free, nutritional, organic, you're feeding your kids the best food in the world for their body and you're letting their mind feed on junk. And, and their little minds are like an open rail, railroad and they go, well I don't make choices for my kids. Well then you're not a parent. You're not a parent. Parents protect kids in the storms of life and one of the storms is all the vulgar, vain, vile things of this planet that are out there in movies, books, songs, radio, television, books and everything else and we let our little kids mind be like a freeway and garbage truck after garbage truck is going into your kids mind and dumping it that's bad parenting parents protect if you protect your kids health you need to protect their mental health too third storm is rejection and this was the storm all of us face at some point in life and it's the most painful storm of all, when we feel betrayed or when we feel rejected. And, and when your children are rejected or when your husband or your wife feel rejection at work, the family needs to rally around and be there as a raincoat in the storms of life. Sometimes it's not just the kids who need protection. 
Sometimes dad's going through a tough time. Sometimes mom's going through a tough time. And everybody rallies around and puts the raincoat on them. And sometimes it's grandma or grandpa who need protection. And the roles reverse. Psalm 71, look here on the screen, verse nine says this. And now in my old age, don't set me aside. Don't abandon me when my strength is failing. Many of you are moving into this stage of life. Your kids have moved out, maybe some have moved back in. <laughs> but at the same time, your parents now need your care and the roles have reversed. There was a time when they wiped your nose and there's a, now there's a time you need to wipe their nose. That's called family. Families are for life. And you don't just abandon somebody because they, quote, aren't useful, according to society. Every life is valuable, and God is watching. And the Bible says a guy who won't take care of his own family is worse than an infidel, an unbeliever. That's what it says. It says in the book of James. Number four, what makes an awesome family? Awesome families are playful. Awesome families encourage growth. Awesome families protect each other. And the fourth one, is real important, and I wanna show you a symbol for it. And this is what makes a difference between average and, and awesome families is a globe. Now, how in the world does this represent an awesome family? Because awesome families don't just care about themselves. They care about others, and they actually care about the whole world. You see, Anybody can care only about their own family. In fact, that's very easy to be selfish. It's us four and no more. And I'm a dad and I'm pouring all my energy into my wife and my kids and everybody else, forget you. Then you're never gonna have an awesome family because awesome families don't just focus on themselves. They focus on others. Average families are self-centered. Average families only care about us. I care about my kid in uh, Little League. I don't care about the kids who don't have a dad. I care about my family. I don't care about anybody else. I'm investing my entire time in this family. Then you're never gonna have an awesome family. You're gonna have an average family because the average family only cares about itself. This is the secret that moves you from average to awesome is you begin to care about more than just your own family. Write this down, number four. Awesome families serve God and others. Actually, we serve God by serving others. It's the way you serve God is by serving others. And awesome families teach their kids it's not about you. You're not the center of the universe. Awesome families teach their kids you were made by God for a mission. Awesome families teach their kids you were shaped to serve God. I am the man that I am today First of all, because of my parents. And my parents instilled in me certain values to care about other people. You know my signature Rick Warren hug? Where do you think I learned that? Not in school. I learned it from watching my parents. My parents were very, very poor. They didn't have any money at all. They served the Lord, they loved the Lord, but they were poor. And they both had the gift of hospitality. And they both loved to give to others even though they were very poor. So we lived out in the country and my dad would plant three quarters of an acre to a full acre in garden, all kinds of vegetables. There was no way we could personally eat all that food but he did it just so he could give it away because he didn't have any money to give away. So we always planted more and then we gave it away to help other people who were in need. And my mother had the gift of hospitality and she said, we will treat everybody with respect. And so our home was constantly filled with other people. If people were in pain, they were at our house. They were spending the night at our house. If they were on the road, they were at our house. If they were going through a conflict, they were at our house. If they were a well-known Christian leader coming through town, they were at our house. Going, growing up, when I would go to bed each night, I would never know who was gonna be at the breakfast table the next morning because somebody would likely come in, spend the night at our place, and I would get to see them. And as a result, I was exposed to all kinds of great Christian leaders because my family had them in their home. 
Some of you, when we do our conferences for pastors, you invite pastors who are coming here from all around the world to stay in your home. That's a good thing for you, it's a good thing for the pastor, but it's a really good thing for your kids to be exposed to Christian leaders from around the world. One day, my dad decided to keep a record of how many meals my mom had cooked for guests in our home in one year, in just one year. And when he added it up, it was over a 1,000 guest meals that my mom had cooked in just one year. And it was in that attitude of give your life away, I grew up. And I learned to realize it's not about me. It's about helping other people. The Bible says this, Hebrews 11, 10, 24. Let us think about each other, not just ourselves, and let us help each other to show love and to do good deeds. That's what awesome families do. We teach each other to show love and we teach each other to do good deeds. Good deeds are called ministry. They're called service. A good example of this is a family in the book of Acts called Stephanus, oh no, Cornelius. Acts 10, 2 says he, Cornelius, and all his family were devout and God-fearing. I want that to be said about your family. Your family is devout and God-fearing. And they gave generously to those in need. And they prayed for God, prayed to God regularly. I, what a great legacy. Wouldn't you have, like to have people write, written, writing that about you and 2,000 years from today they're saying that your family was devout and God-fearing, you gave generously to those in need, and you prayed to God regularly. What a testimony, what an awesome. See, awesome families model dedication, model service, model generosity, and model prayer. That's what awesome families do. Average families don't do those things. Awesome families do. By the way, are you modeling generosity for your kids? Are you teaching your kids to be selfish or unselfish? Are you, if, you, if they see you giving, then they're gonna become givers. If they see you being generous, they're gonna be generous. When, I, when my kids were little, I gave them each of them three piggy banks. And in their allowance, their own allowance, if they got 30 cents, it was divided a dime, a dime, a dime. 10 cents for giving, 10 cents for saving, and 10 cents for spending. And then when their allowance went to a dollar, it's a dollar goes into saving, a dollar goes into spending, and a dollar goes into giving. And I was teaching my kids that you don't spend everything you get. Did you learn that growing up? Obviously, most Americans didn't because most Americans are spending more than they get. They're in debt, they're in hawk, their credit cards are max limits, because nobody taught them as a kid, you don't spend everything you get. You put some of it in savings, you put some of it in giving to the Lord and other people, and then some of it you get spent. Now I realize that was a 33% tithe, but that's okay with the kids. <laughs> and they learn, and my, learn, my kids learn generosity. When we built this building, my kids took, they were grade schoolers, took on little jobs to make money. My two sons, Josh and Matthew, gave their baseball card collections, including a Ken Griffey rookie card, and that, that, their cards brought in like 550 bucks. They gave that to build this building. You think they regret it? Of course not, of course not. So they learn generosity. You must teach them generosity by modeling it. And teach your kids like if they have a birthday party and today they're getting so many gifts, maybe they decide two things that they already have that because they're getting these new gifts, they should give those to somebody else and share the gifts that they've already got. Now some with somebody else, the toys. And learn that. And when you're driving down the street and you see a homeless person standing on the corner with a sign that says, we'll work for food. You have a teachable moment for those kids in the back seat. What do we do about people who have less than we have? Do we just ignore them, look the other way, and drive past them? Or I would highly recommend, I've seen Kay do this, I can't tell you how many times. Roll down the window and then say, what's your name? In other words, first, you identify them as an individual. They're not a charity case, they're a human being and they deserve dignity and they deserve respect. They're just out of work. They don't have any money. It's not like they're a non-human. What's your name? And then what I highly recommend you do is you go buy and stock up on some 
Orange County bus passes, OCTD bus passes, and keep them right there in the front of your car. And every time you see a homeless person on the corner, you roll down the window and say, here's a bus pass, go to the Peace Center at Saddleback Church, they'll gladly help you. Does that make sense? Okay. We have fed over 100,000 people at the Peace Center, and we'll help them too. If you wanna do more than that, go out and buy some gift cards. Get some McDonald's or Starbucks gift cards. If you say, I don't wanna give money because they might use it for drugs. Well, they might. You don't know. But if you give them a gift card, you can have those stacked up right there. You can just open them. And guess what? You are modeling for the kids in the back seat. We help people. We don't, we don't just bypass people in pain. We're teaching them the value of charity with it, service to God and others. But we've always taught that mission is both global and local. We say you have to have bifocal vision. You have to care about the people in your neighborhood and you have to care about people all around the world. You have to have bifocal vision, global, we call it global and local, global vision. And maybe you can't go on a peace trip around the world right now, but you could do something this week right here. We have over 500 hundred ministries in the community. I guarantee you, your family could do one of them. Let me just give you an example. We have one called Meals Ministry, and we cook meals and we provide meals to people who are sick and can't cook for themselves while they're going through illness. You and your kids, mom and dad and kids could cook the meal together, mom and dad and kids take the meal to the home, deliver it at the front door, and the kids get the idea, we're not just about ourselves. This is what family does. This is what the church family does. Now let me close with a couple of verses. 1 Corinthians 16, is here on the screen, is a model of a family, an awesome family. It says, remember Stephanus and his family. They were the first to become Christians in Greece. And they now are spending their lives helping and serving Christians everywhere. What a legacy. You want that legacy for your family? that you're known thousands of years from today, that you're spending your lives helping and serving Christians everywhere? What a reputation. What I'm saying is this. Awesome families are not perfect families, but they are intentional. They're, they become awesome by choice. And you don't, you're not an awesome family by accident. You become an awesome family by making choices, making decisions, making commitments, and even making sacrifices. And my challenge you today is to say, you know what, no matter what stage I am in my family's life, I'm gonna make the rest of it the best of it. And we're gonna become an awesome family for whatever remaining days we've got in it. We're gonna become an awesome family and we're gonna start a new legacy and we're gonna leave a legacy and it begins by making a choice to commit your family to God, to Jesus Christ. The Bible says this in Joshua 24, the last verse on your outline. Choose today whom you will serve. You're gonna serve yourself, you're gonna serve society, you're gonna serve values, choose money, you're gonna serve money. Choose today whom you will serve. Joshua says, but as for me and my family, we're gonna serve the Lord. Okay? I don't care what other families do, me and my family, we're gonna serve the Lord. And until you make that decision, dad, husband, Mom, as for me and my family, we're gonna serve the Lord. It's not gonna be an awesome family. It's gonna be an average family. Let's bow for prayer. If you've never given your life to Christ, that's the starting point. If you've never given your family to Christ, that's the starting point. Would you pray this prayer in your heart? Dear Jesus Christ, I want to live an awesome life, and I want to have an awesome family, and I know I won't have either if I just live for myself. So today, I give myself to you. As for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. And I want my family to be a place of play and fun, not just work and negativity. I want my family to be a place where we encourage each other to grow constantly. Thank you for a church that helps our family grow. I wanna be a family 
that is a shelter in a storm, a safe haven, a safe place, a refuge. Help me to protect my family, not just their bodies, but also their minds. And I want my family to serve you by serving others. Help us to find our family mission, our family purpose, what you shaped our family to do. Help me to teach my kids to be generous by modeling generosity to God and to others. Help me to have a bifocal vision to not just care about my family, but to teach my kids, my wife, my husband, and all of us to care about the whole world. And may we model dedication and service and generosity and prayer. I can't do this on my own, Lord. So I ask you to come into my life and take complete control of every area of me and give me the power to do the right thing. In your name I pray, amen.